this is Lynn Hunter, L-L-Y-N-H-U-N-T-E-R, and today we are going to finish off um, a J for jellyfish for my beach bet. And this happens to be a Pacific nettle jellyfish. Um, in my last video, if you haven't seen it, um, check the link below, and it'll show you how to draw, how we drew um, the jellyfish that you see here. I started out with a um, Portuguese man of war accidentally. Um, they're not jellyfish. They're um, a colony creature that is a hydroid, and I, I realized this after the fact. I was thinking so much about the color, because they have such beautiful colors, that I wasn't thinking about the fact that, oops, that's not really a jellyfish. So, I redrew the jellyfish, and this is a Pacific nettle jellyfish, and um, I'm a big advocate for, um, oh, sorry, didn't mean to hit the camera, doing well. Anyways, um, I'm a big advocate for reference. This is my iPad. I just Googled jellyfish and I Googled Pacific nettle jellyfish. And I have that reference off in front of me off camera um, so that I'm looking at the various colors while I'm painting this. Um, next time, maybe I'll, I'll uh, find something that's not copyrightable. That's a problem with when you're doing a video like this, um, trying to um, not get in trouble for copyright is a difficult thing. Okay, anyways, this is a very old brush, and it's old brush because you can see the, uh, I don't know if you can see on the camera here, but half the, um, the nice gold lettering that's normally on this thing has been worn off, um, and the tip is still good. I would say this might even be at least a 10-year-old brush. Um, and with, it's a, um, series seven sable. They're a little on this pricey side. You can get them at Blick for, um, probably $20 for a number two. Um, I haven't priced them in a while. It's time to get a new one, but, um, I find that they wear nicely. I mean, as the, the, the little hairs come off, they break off so that you still always seem to have a tip and they hold the water well. And they're, like I said, they're a bit on the pricey side. But um, I've been using Windsor Newton Series 7 since I first started, well, since I could first afford a $20 brush. Um, they're worth it. You know, you can get tons of brushes. You know, you might be able to get 10 brushes for the price of a, a Windsor Newton. But once you've used a Series 7 sable brush, you will never go back. Um, anyways, actually, let me put that to the side for the moment, come to think of it. Um, because that is not where we are starting on this project as I'm ah here we go um this I bring this up a million times this is a kneaded eraser what we're gonna do is you, you can see I still have some pencil lines on here we have the um, guidelines that I used to create my J and we've got elements of the jellyfish still in there so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take my kneaded eraser and we're gonna erase all those lines back and um, I like the kneaded eraser because it doesn't um, destroy your drawing, the underdrawing, or the I should say the top drawing, as much as um, the latex will. And to get your initial um, pencil lines out, that's probably the nicest things to use. I, and if they all come out with the kneaded eraser, um, I won't go back in with the latex, but um, this is a latex eraser. Most of your um, kids' erasers and everything are made out of this. It's just um, your artificial latex. Um, it's not really uh, latex. Um, they use, say, latex. It's an artificial rubber. And um, it's what most of your erasers, your white erasers or the colored erasers are made out of nowadays. It's a plastic eraser. And just go over that, you know, lightly so you get a few kernels. And uh, take this and hold it over your trash can and swipe the, uh, the dust off. And there. Now we're ready to paint this thing. Um, some of the lines will get lighter because you've, you've taken the, the, the pencil line totally out of there. So it's like where sometimes the, you had a thicker line or you had a more complete line. It was really a pencil line and now it's erased. When we get done with the painting, you can go back in and... The last thing I do, um, I won't be doing it on on this particular video because it takes another, you know, five minutes to go in and get that detail after the fact. Um, but if you go back in with the pen after you finish painting 
it gives you that nice um, finished look. Okay, what I'm going to do first is I'm going to lightly um, take some Prussian blue. Okay, this this color here, it's Prussian blue. It's kind of a turquoise blue. Now you notice there's already some paint on my palette. If I get too much paint on my palette from a previous project, I'll go in with a damp paper towel and wipe up my palette. But a lot of times I'll just leave the paint on the palette because, you know, here's some purple here and then I'll mix in them with the blue and it'll take down the color a little bit. Or I might, you know, I already have some colors on the palette that I might mix in that I might normally not think to mix in. And I find that it's kind of a happy serpent stance. If you like your colors more pure and you don't want that to happen, before you start painting, Go over your palette with a paper towel and the whole thing will clean up um, completely white. Okay, so what I'm gonna do, um, I, I'm, I've got the water here so you can see how often I dip into the water and if I've got too much water, I've got a paper towel here and I'll wipe it off on the paper towel. And I hate to say it, it's something that you get to learn after you've been working with watercolor a while as to how heavy of water is in your brush. And it's funny, I used to hate it when people would tell me, oh, but you've got to experience that you can't just know off the top of your head and or it, it, it'll drive you nuts, but I hate to say it, experience is your best bet. Doing lots of paintings is your best bet always for any tool, any um, technique that you're using. I can see what I'm doing right now is I'm I'm kind of doing like you would would uh, do a stained glass window. I'm taking the areas that um, have line in them, and I'm these are basically tentacles. So I'm painting um, a little bit of blue watercolor inside there, and I'm keeping it light. Whenever you're working watercolor, um, it's a transparent medium. And you want to go from light to dark. So the thing is, is that if you go too dark, the, the one color that, that really you'll get into trouble with is probably purple. Most of the other colors you can always um, find a way to pull up. Or if it's a dye-based color, um, they might be a little bit difficult to pull up after you've laid them down. But most watercolors have a pigment base to them. So once that they you've laid them down, if you get it too dark, most of the time, think about it, it it's almost like having a palette on the paper. And you can pull up any excessive amount of water that you put, or excessive amount of color that you put into the, um, the paper, or onto the paper. So... Um, your best bet is always start light, try to keep, you know, it's like, see these puddles here? I mean, that's why I'm, I'm starting with puddle on the palette too, is that there's just a little bit of pigment there. It's not like I'm having to go into the, the pigment that's here in the big pans and, and um, get it scumbled up. You just scumble the, the little bit of residue there, and that keeps your, your, your initial painting light too. So that's an, another way, reason why it's kind of nice to have that, that, you know, extra paint on your palette afterwards. And it's like, I'm not a big one for, you know, keeping everything neat and squeaky clean. It's not the way I paint. It's not the type of person I am. You can see on my palette, probably, I mean, yeah, I can tell right there, I've got cat hair. Um, I have a marvelous little black cat named Smudge. And she adds to my paintings all the time. The nice thing is, is once they're dry... You can brush your cat hairs away. The other problem is, is that the uh, watercolor tends to uh, um, group around cat hair, so it's like, yeah, okay, that's not the way I wanted that painted. And you learn how to fix your mistakes. Okay, now you can see here, like, um, in this area right here, it's just a little bit darker. There's more pigment in here. This puddle right here will probably die, dry a little dark. Some of the other ones will dry a little darker. But I, that's just to get my initial background behind there started. Now, the um, sea nettle, when they um, photograph it, mind you, when you see it probably in real life, it probably looks um, brownish in the water and white. But once they 
um, put a light on it, it, it tends to get bright orange and yellow. So I'm going to start with um, a cad yellow. Let's see here. You can see the cad yellow over here. There's a little bit of um, green that has got mixed in with it. Now, when you're working with cad yellow, it's real. This is a cadmium yellow medium, I believe. Um, I like to have my yellows to the orange or the red side or the warm side rather than the cool side. Um, just because yellows to the warm, the cool side have a tendency to have a sickening quality to them. I personally feel, um, they're good. and a, a warm yellow won't dull down your greens all that much, but it's always good for making oranges and browns and what have you. And I'm going to mix it in. You can tell there's a little bit of red there. So I'm going a little bit more orange now. The yellows, the reds, um, they have a lot of pigment. They're very heavy pigmented. So again, you want to get that kind of, there's a puddle there. You make sure you get a big puddle. And I have it, you mix it up because you've got your glue or your um, um, gum arabic is the glue in watercolor that um, dissolves as you add water to it. And when you mix it up, that makes sure that you've got your gum arabic is all even in there so that when you put it down, we're going to put it down here in the the um, the cone part of the jelly. And I am just going to puddle that through. And it, the thing is, is you start in one cor corner and you work away. And that will give it a nice even flow. Now the thing is, is with watercolor... Um, I know a lot of people feel that it's difficult to control. The best thing to do is imagine watercolor, let the watercolor do its own thing. Um, it's always works out better if you just don't worry too much about, you know, staying in the lines. Try to stay, you know, it's like we've got these marvelous little um, uh, curly cues or ruffles. In the center, the tentacles in the center of, of the jellyfish are um, lighter, more yellow, and uh, they're they're like ruffles in a uh, 1960s vintage or a turn of the century vintage uh, shirt. And you just want to kind of scumble scumble the color through. And it's getting a little heavy in there, so what I'm doing is I'm adding some more water. There's, I just added water without adding any pigment. And you can see how it just flowed along by just adding the water to it and got a little bit lighter and a little bit more transparent. But the one thing, like I said, about especially the yellows and the reds, um, they are going to lay down. You can see where um, it's laying down. It will dull the, the line work beneath it, even though the big stick is technically um, water resistant. So it, it's like it pushes the, the pigment to the side so that the, um, if you ever did crayon resist when you were a kid in grade school, it kind of works like that. And so it, it stands out through it. Um, um, India ink works much better. At that India ink is is got varnish in it. It's it's like it has a lacquer in it, and it has a much, even better resistance to the pigment and the um, the the water. But it's still um, your pigment's going to lay on over it even with with the um, with the. Uh, its ability to resist. Now you can see I'm doing a little stippling here so you can feel like the, that you see um, something in the background. And it also adds interest. I like to stipple, add a little stippling to add interest. Okay, now we're gonna take um, some cad red and I'm gonna put the cad red right here next to the yellow. And you can tell I'm, I'm getting a little purple in there. There's a little purple on my palette, and I'm getting a little purple in there, and I'm getting next to the yellow. And then I'm gonna, there's some alizarin crimson is right next to my cad red. So this this red is a warm red. This red is a cool red. And pull my water glass back. And and my the water my water glass is just a mug. It's my my uh, Ducati teacup. Is what I'm using for my my water cup. And it's just because it, it's it's 
large enough to have enough water in it that when you put your brush into it, it'll dissolve whatever's in your brush and um, dissipate the water and keep it relatively clean, and I mean relatively. Um, and it's um, small enough that it doesn't get in my way, per se. Um, okay, okay, I want a little bit more alizarin, I want that a little bit thicker. Okay, so the thing is, is that if I want something really thick, I'll come to um, the pan and paint from the pan, but for the most part, I'll paint from these puddles of color on my palette. And so, um, let's see here, as I'm mixing it up, uh, I've seen it's kind of difficult to get everything you want to show um, in one uh, view part. Now you can see that particular um, red is very, very heavy in the pigment. So it's, it's kind of covering up the line as I paint it. But watercolor number one, will it will dry totally different color than what you mix. Usually it will dry a bit lighter. It'll go down darker and dry lighter. So if you, um, if it, the color value would be around 100% when you lay it down, Think about going anywhere from 25 to 50% lighter value when it dries. And sometimes you, you just have to go over it again, or you have to be brave enough to lay down a really dark um, value of the color. I personally just prefer to lay it down light and then come back in later and darken it, just because it's always... I don't know, I find it always easier to darken a color um, than per se lighten it, but um, it's not that difficult to lighten either. I mean, or it all depends, again, um, on how badly the color stains. Now, red will stain pretty well, but even then, it's because it's such a heavy pigmented color, most of it will come up if you want it to. I'll um, let one of these red lines draw, and I'll show you how to pick up the pigment. If you don't like, okay, I laid down that big heavy red line and I didn't like it and I want to either lighten it up or take it up. But right now we're just, we're laying in all these tentacles and the tentacles um, on this particular jellyfish happen to be red. And I got that little bloop there of paint. So I'm going to take my paper towel and I'm going to dab it right there and lo and behold, it disappeared. Or, and when it dries, I mean, you can still see a little, little hint of red there, but when it dries, you won't notice it. I mean, the, in the overall comp um, composition of the piece, you will not notice one little red dot that kind of escaped to that portion. And if you still, if it still bothers you in some way, you can go back in after it dries again and hit it with some more water and scumble it up. Um, and just remember, with watercolor, watercolor is a lot of happy accidents. And that's, I think, more than anything else is um, why a lot of people get frustrated with watercolor is because it's, you control it to a degree. And my attitude is, and then it paints itself. I mean, one of the reasons why I like watercolor too is that, um, you don't have to work as hard as if you're using an opaque medium, I personally feel. And some people feel the exact opposite. They feel that, you know, oh, geez, it's, it's so difficult to control that it's not as easy to work with as a pigmented medium. Okay, we're going to do the, these are orange. This area around here is like a heavier orange. And again, um, I'm using the, um, the photographic res reference and so that, that if somebody saw this and they knew what a, uh, a nettle jellyfish looked like, they'd know immediately, oh, that's a Pacific nettle jellyfish. Cause, um, I believe the, uh, the East coast nettles are more white. They, they have, um, more of a, uh. Um, all the all that you see that is is yellow and orange in a Pacific 
nettle jellyfish is white and an East Coast jellyf nettle jellyfish. So, you know, somebody who would say from, was from California, let's get that one little, there we go. Now you notice, see that, that little pink that, that I, I more or less pulled that up. There's still a little bit of pink there. And if it bothered me or I didn't get it with the outline when I get done with the entire piece, I'd scrape it away with an X-Acto knife blade. Um, you can always, with watercolor, um, again, because it's pigmented, you use uh, an X-Acto knife blade scraping the surface like you would, um, you, like you're sanding down the paper. I'm going to put a little bit of, I'm just letting water, this is just water in the brush. I stuck the water in the brush, in the water, and then I'm just using the brush that went into the water to get a more of a transparent look there, and I'm taking the color out of this and making it more like a shadow. Yeah. And to, we've got more of an edge here, so I'm going to take that away. So I'm, in, I'm just painting with water right now. There's some pigment in there, but it's not because I added the pigment. It's because it's picking up the pigment that, um, like, see, I'm, I'm scumbling this area here. And what I'll do is the br brush then, because it doesn't have as much water in it, acts like a sponge and it sucks that area up. And that's kind of something you'll learn as you go along too, is that as your brush loses the water, if you need to suck up an area of water, take the water completely out of your brush and then go to the wet area and you can use your brush like a sponge and it'll suck up the water in that area like a sponge. And then you wipe it off on your paper and then it makes the, the tip of your brush dry again so that you can do that again. Now I'm going to go in and I want to get some shadows in here now and I want I think I want to take the background around the uh, jellyfish make it a little bit more blue so I'm going to take some more blue into some areas and I'm also going to bring some purple in for shadows. Um, I'm a real big fan of purple shadows. Um, black and I'm also I am not opposed to black shadows um, there are a lot of watercolor people who are like totally okay now you can see how as I go over the blue all of a sudden that blue really starts going dark because we've, we've got blue under there already and I picked up a lot of blue into my brush and this is going real blue now and that's more of a, um, a turquoise um, green blue and I think I might take I'm gonna put there's a little bit of uh, cobalt next to it and cobalt um, cobalt is more again a, a, a more of a, a um, it's a red blue green uh, to the yellow side and then if you want to go more to the the purple side or the red side you want to go for ultramarine and that's not true um, uh, yeah, it is. Ultramarine goes around a little bit more to the green side. And that's the thing, too, is once you start painting with the colors, you start getting a feel for what color looks good next to a, a color, what looks good over color. Now, as, as I get the blue into the yellow, of course, I'm going to get some green hints here and there. Because, you know, standard base of mixing colors, you mix yellow and blue and you get green so you're going to get some little green hints in this as well and so it ends up giving it a, a little bit of a rainbow effect by adding and crossing over some of the boundaries and then I'm going to just empty this I'm going to put just take some water in here and I'm going to just do a little bit of scumbling on this to get where there are areas of like open white that I don't I don't want it to be white I don't want to see you'll get a few little speckles of white in there but I I want this jade to pretty much be fully colored so I'm just um, kind of washing it over with the white to get the um, 
ambient colors or the colors in the area to bleed into any areas that have white in them. And that gives it, you know, an overall, you can tell the J is now standing out more as a shape as well as a jellyfish. And I'm gonna go with a little bit more cobalt blue down here. And by you're using a little bit of a variety in your blue, um, it, it will give a little bit of depth change as well between the light and the dark and also um, the cool and the warm. And what happens too when you've just you just spent that time going over or just spent the time going over with the, the water and these colors will bleed into each other and they'll make colors that you weren't anticipating. You weren't anticipating the value, you weren't anticipating the hue, and that's okay because it's it basically the paint itself is coming up with this interesting variety that is in the same harmony range because you, you're using um, a basic palette of colors and so they'll, they'll harmonize together. And even the grays, because you, you've um, gotten into areas, will mix a little bit differently. Okay, I'm gonna put a little bit of, mm, I'm thinking alizarin, because alizarin is red to the purple side and I'm going to put a little bit of that under this in the uh, the bottom part of the jelly here to give it a little bit more of a um, again things go into shadow go darker so the 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 color is going to um, a more red under here so it get, all of a sudden gets a feeling of turning by putting that, that uh, darker alizarin in there. And it mixes in, it's like that cool red is mixing in with the warm red. And it'll find like a, a medium between cool and warm that um, is really nice. I use it a lot when I'm, when I'm painting a cherry. You'll use a warm and a cool red and it'll really make a cherry round by using the two, um, by using the warm and the cool, as well as the light and the dark. So we're gonna go make some, use the alizarin down here in the back. And then, like I said, I'm gonna go in with just, just a hint of, um, this is purple. Um, I find that mixing purples doesn't really work. Um, it do, it'll work maybe putting a little bit of alizarin in. You can see that that gets a no, nice purple to the more of the uh, red side. But um, I mixing purples tends to get muddy, so I usually will uh, usually will buy a, a violet um, just because it it comes out better that way. Um, just also, purples go dark fast, so um, be very, very wary about how you lay on purple because um, it will change the value of whatever you're painting. It, that's why it makes a good shading color. Rather, if you don't want to use black, my two major suggestions are um, purple and... Uh, actually, I like purple. I like to use Prussian blue and my all-time favorite... Um, alternative for black is Payne's Gray. I really love Payne's Gray. We're not using it in this particular instance. And I'm going to put a few lines in here. I think we're just about done here. And then what I said I'm going to do is I, I'll, I'll, I would let this sit for about mm, 20, 30 minutes tops. I mean, that's that's about all it takes for, for the paper to really get to that point where you can work it again. And I'm going to go over the entire drawing one more time with the ballpoint pen. Um, I will go around the edges and I will detail, I will detail up things in here. Um, and 
that will pull the entire painting together. Um, don't think that when you do the line drawing or do the inking on a piece that that's it and you're done. Um, it really pops when you put that, that black line on it at the end. And that's it. That's our J jellyfish for um, my beach bet. Um, oh, I just saw one more thing I want to do. It's like, oh, one more thing, one more thing. I mean, I am the perpetual one more thing. It has this kind of like line across the top. And it's like I'm looking up at my my reference material here, and it, it kind of has almost um, it's got a separate kind of darker color going across the top of it. And I'm putting a little bit towards the back, so it kind of feels like you've got the transparency in there. And I think I'll I'll put a little bit of dotting there, and then. Paper towel. What? What? So that you don't have, you know, we've got this edge here. Not really liking that total edge there. So I'm going in with water to just clean up that edge a little bit. What? And again, if I took too much out or I didn't like what I did with it, you know, you take it all out and then you put it back. And then you take it out and you put it back. And that's why you want to use um, a good... Uh, usually 150 pound or it's 300 gram watercolor paper because it can take a licking and keep on ticking. If you go under that weight, you'll find that the paper starts coming up. Or if you have to correct something and you have to scrape away the paper, there's not enough size in it. And size is the thing that allows the paper to suck in watercolor or push it away and a good watercolor paper will use good size or sizing it's like a starch and um, you don't have to know really what it's made of but it's it's basically kind of like a starch and uh, that's what uh, sucks in or repels the watercolor from your paper. So that's it. That's our J. Um, thank you very much for taking the time to come and watch me paint. I hope that you learned something. I hope you enjoyed my chattering on and I had something to give to you. And that's it for today. Please come back again next week and see what new I've got for you. Thanks again. Bye-bye.